Welcome to Big Valley Grace. If you have a Bible, you can turn to Hebrews chapter 11. If uh, you don't have a copy of the Word of God uh, inside your little program, you'll find some notes and all the verses that we're going to look at, or most of them will be here, or they'll come up on the jumbotrons. We want you to see the Word of God for yourself. Uh, If you don't own a Bible, uh, you can go into the altar room or their altar room over in the uh, venue and you can pick one up. We, we've got a Bible that we'd love to put in your hands. And uh, this is a church that believes that this is God's word, that this is God's inerrant word. And because it's God's word, because it's his inerrant word, we believe that this is truth. It's absolute truth. And we want you to be able to see the words of God on your own. So if you don't have a copy of the Bible, give us the the privilege of putting in your hands maybe your first Bible or maybe your family's uh, first Bible. And we've got a whole bunch of them in in the altar room. Hebrews chapter 11, uh, which is often called God's Hall of Fame, is filled with different men and women who were used by God in some really great ways. Now, um, all of these people weren't weren't perfect. All of these people that we read about in Hebrews chapter 11, they they struggled with sin just like all of us in this room. If you're visiting with us and maybe you don't know the the Lord, maybe you don't know much about Christianity, um, nobody in this room is, is perfect. Everybody in this room is going to struggle with sin. But those of us that do know the Lord, those of us that have invited Christ into our lives, we're forgiven of our sins. The the relationship between us and the Father has been restored because our sins have been forgiven. We now have a power source within us greater than ourselves so that we can overcome those, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the sin within us. But just because somebody is a Christian, just because somebody's a follower of the Lord doesn't mean that they're going to live, you know, a, a perfect life. This side of heaven, this side of glory, none of us in this room are going to live a perfect life. And when you see these great men and women of, in, in Hebrews chapter 11, God did some really great things w- with their lives, but, but they weren't perfect people. They struggled with sin just like all of us in this room um, struggle with sin. And one of those people that you read about in Hebrews chapter 11 is, is Moses. Moses is considered by many uh, to be the greatest person of the Old Testament. In fact, if you were to talk to an Orthodox Jew and you were to ask them, who's the, you know, the, the, the greatest Jew that ever lived, without a doubt, they would say, Moses. Without a, without a doubt. God used Moses to lead the people of Israel out of 400 years of slavery in, in Egypt. God did a bunch of different miracles through Moses, like the splitting of the, the Red Sea. God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. God used Moses to write the, the first five books of the Bible, and the list goes on and on and on. He was an amazing man. Every Christian should know about his life and his contribution to the faith. Um, but as amazing as he was, he, he was still a man. He didn't follow God perfectly. He made some huge blunders throughout his life, and I wish I had time to tell you about a few of them, but, but, but I don't. Basically, you can read about Moses' life and his ministry in Exodus and um, uh, Leviticus, Numbers, those books. But uh, Hebrews chapter 11 gives us um, the cliff notes, if you will, of the life of Moses. Uh, There's a little passage in Hebrews 11 that kind of boils down this unbelievable man's life into just a few verses, and I I want to read it for us. Uh, today. Hebrews 11 verse 23 says, it was by faith that Moses' parents hid him for three months when he was born. They saw that God had given them an unusual child and they were not afraid to disobey the king's command. It was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. 
He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking ahead to his great reward. It was by faith that Moses left the land of Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He kept right on going because he kept his eye on the one who was invisible. Now as I, I, I look at this, th there are a, a number of choices that, that, that Moses makes that I think are important for us to, to look at and wrestle around with. Um, I often come back to this passage in sermons and even in my own life because there's a lot here that we as believers can learn from the life of Moses. He made some unbelievable choices in these five verses that, that I want us to, to, to wrestle around with, or, or at least three of those choices. And the first one's this. Moses made the choice to be who God made him to be. That's the first thing we see in this passage, is that Moses made a choice. And that choice was he was going to be who God made him to be. Look at verse 24 again. It was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Beloved, I want you to know that if you want to be used by God, if you want your one life to count or matter, you've got to make the same decision that Moses did. You've got to make the choice to be who God made you to be. We're living in a time when, uh, you know, we can see all these images of people on TV, movie stars and athletes. We can pick up magazines. There's a thousand of them in our grocery stores or whatever, and we see these pictures of, you know, beautiful men and women. We can look around us at uh, our friends and see, you know, uh, the, the talents and the gifts that they have, and it's really easy to say, man, I want to be like that guy. I want to be like that guy, gal. I, 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 I want to do what that guy's doing. I want to do what that gal's doing. I want to look like that gal. I want to, you know, look like that guy. There is a, um, I don't, I don't, we have the, the tendency within our flesh to be drawn to those kinds of thoughts. And if you want to be used by the Lord, you've got to make the same decision that Moses did, and that was this. I don't want to be anybody else but who God made me to be. Now, I want to make sure that you understand what happened in the life of Moses. There was a, a moment in history when all the Jewish boys were condemned to die in Egypt. So when Moses was a baby, his mother put him in a little basket and sent him down the, the Nile River. She was trying to save his life. And probably all of you that are moms in here understand that, right? Imagine you're living in Egypt. And imagine a decree comes that says you've got to kill your little boy, your baby. You'd probably do the same thing Moses' mother did, a lot of you, or try to. Moses' mom takes Mo, you know, the baby, puts him in a little tiny basket, and sends him down the Nile River. And it happened that the daughter of Pharaoh was taking a bath one day in the river, and she saw the baby that was drifting down the river, and she took him back into the palace, and she raised it as if it were her own. Now, don't miss this. Moses was the son of a Hebrew slave, but he was raised as Pharaoh's grandson in Pharaoh's palace, which was the most opulent place on the planet at the time. Now, many years later, a day came when Moses learned the truth about who he was and where he had originally come from, and at that mo moment, Moses had a choice to make. He had to decide... Am I Jewish or am I an Egyptian? Am I a slave or am I royalty? And the consequences of that decision would affect the rest of his life. If he chose to say, I'm Pharaoh's grandson, Moses is going to enjoy a life of fame. He'll enjoy a life of fortune, a life of luxury. Think about it. He's an heir to the throne of Pharaoh. 
If he chooses to say, I, I, I'm Jewish, I'm really the, the son of a Jewish slave, he'll be rejected, he'll be despised, he'll be thrown out of the palace, he'll be humiliated. He'll have to live as a, as a slave. He had to decide, who am I? <laughs> and that wasn't an easy choice. Think about it. All of a sudden, here is this great moment of decision. Well, obviously, Moses chose not to live a lie. He saw what was happening to his people, the Jews, and he couldn't be silent, and so he made the choice that cost him, really, the next 80 years of his life. He made the choice to be who he was created to be. Beloved, you're no different than Moses. God made you for a purpose. God has a, a, a plan for your life. Jeremiah chapter 29 says this, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. And here's the deal. God has a plan for each of you. Even those of you that are here and, and you don't even know them. The, the, you know, the, the sin in your life has, has so taken over your you know, your, your whole being that you don't even believe in God. All of us, by the way, start there. There was a time in my life when I didn't believe in God. There was a time in my life when I rejected God. There was a time in my life when I just was living in my sin. Obviously, something happened. But make no mistake about it, God has a plan for each of your lives. You may not know what that plan is. Maybe God hasn't necessarily revealed it, all of it to you. There was a moment when Moses didn't know the entire plan. But then God reveals it to Moses. And at that moment, he, he's got this unbelievable choice he's got to make. Do, do I follow the plan? Or, or not. Beloved, you may not know what God's plan is for your life right now, but he has one. And a part of that plan is this. God wants you to be you. That's kind of a bizarre thought here in the 21st century in America. Everybody's running around trying to be somebody else. Trying to look like somebody else trying to talk like somebody else, trying to dress like somebody else, trying to have homes like somebody else, trying to drive cars like somebody else. God just wants you to be you. He didn't want you to be anybody else. He just wants you to be you, so quit trying to be somebody else. Quit trying to be somebody you're not. Quit trying to look like everybody else or, or, or talk like everybody else or, or buy all the things that everybody else is, you know, is buying. Be yourself. Be who God made you to be. Look, I love my wife deeply, but I don't want to be what my wife wants me to be. I love my kids deeply, but I don't want to be what my kids want me to be. I love my friends deeply, but I don't want to be what my friends want me to be. I love you deeply, but I don't want to be what you want me to be. I only want to be what God made me to be. And let me just tell you something. That makes life pretty easy. It takes the pressure off. When you just say, all I want to do is be who God made me to be. That's all. Jesus said this in, in Matthew chapter 6. He said, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or about your body, you know, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? 
And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They don't labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the, the, uh, the grass of the field, which is here today, and tomorrow is thrown in the fire, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans, unbelievers, run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things, food, clothing, shelter, they'll be added unto you. Basically, what Jesus is saying here is that unbelievers are consumed with thoughts about how to have their physical needs met. But Jesus said that his disciples are to have a, a different thought. They're to be consumed with the thoughts about his kingdom and his righteousness. God wants you to be consumed with what matters to him, not what matters to anybody else. So quit worrying about what everybody else is doing or saying or wearing or whatever and simply make the choice to be who God made you to be. That's what matters. Seek God and his kingdom and his righteousness. Make, make this the choice. What God's plan is for your life. And God promises you do that, you make that choice and he'll take care of all the rest. Nobody watches a crow go out and plant corn and then water the corn and then watch the corn grow and then the corn, you know, the crow flies and picks the corn and goes and stores it in a barn. <laughs> God just supplies food and water for the crow. And he didn't die on a cross for a crow. He died on a cross for you. He, he cares for you. He loves you. Seek him first. Be who God made you to be. It was the first decision that Moses really had to wrestle around with. Is be who God made you to be. Now the second choice that Moses made was this. Moses made the choice to do what was right over what felt good. He had to make a choice, do I, do I do what is right or do I do what feels good? Look at verse 25. He, that's Moses, chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He, Moses, thought it was better off to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt. One version says, he, that's Moses, chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. Beloved, th this one's a, a really hard one for people because we as human beings like pleasure, don't we? Man, our flesh likes pleasure. In fact, we love pleasure so much that we'll blow off God and his will for our lives to experience it. Hmm. You know, 29 years here on staff here at Big Valley Grace, and before that I was a, you know, just a lay person serving in ministry. I can't even count how many times somebody, a follower of Jesus, had a choice. Do I do the right thing? Do I do the God-honoring thing? Do I follow the Lord and His will for my life? Or do I go after the pleasure? And by the way, the pleasure could be two or three minutes worth of pleasure. And I can't tell you how many Christians I have seen who've gone after the pleasure and literally it ruined their life, broke up their family, kids hate them, 
lost their friends, <laughs> maybe lost their business, lost their reputation, all for just a couple of minutes, literally a couple of minutes of pleasure. Man, we, we love pleasure. And Moses was no different. He had the same flesh that we've got. And here, he, he has this, you know, decision to make. Do, do I go after the pleasures of being, you know, the grandson of Pharaoh? And all that goes along with that? Or do I do the right thing? This was an impressive decision that Moses made. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. You gotta underline that word chose. You see it there? Whether it's in your Bible or in your notes. You gotta underline that word, he chose. Listen, if you want your one life to count, if you wanna make an impact with your one life, you gotta make the right choices in life. God set up this thing called life in such a way that you get to make a choice about things. For instance, um, you read your Bible as much as you want to read it. It's your choice. You study your Bible as much as you want to study it. It's your choice. You meditate on the Word of God as much as you want to meditate on it. It's your choice. You memorize as much Scripture as you want to memorize. It's your choice. Now, I'll stand up here and encourage you to read the Word and study the Word and meditate on the Word. I'll, I'll, I'll do that as much as I can. And, you know, the men's ministry will encourage you guys to read the Word and all that. And women's ministries will encourage you to do all that. Your friends will do that. Probably your spouse is, is doing that. All we can do is encourage you to do it. But you get to make the choice as to how much time you're going to spend, you see, in the Word. You, you, you get to make the choice whether you want to come to our men's ministry or not. You get to make the choice as to whether you want to come to our women's ministries or not. You get to make the choice and whether you want to attend our, our parenting ministries or, or not. It's your choice. You get to make those choices. You watch, you know... TV as much as you want to watch it, right? It's your, it's your choice. You can honor the, the Lord with your wealth or not. <laughs> it's your choice. You can spend your money however you want to spend it. It's your choice. God has given you the freedom of choice, and the choices you make have a lot to do with your future. Let me, uh, let me go down a little bit of a rabbit trail, if I, if I could, here, just for a moment. Proverbs chap chapter 15 gives us this really stark uh, contrast. It says this, a wise man is hungry for knowledge or truth, while the fool feeds on trash. And in your Bibles or in your notes, you ought to underline the word truth or knowledge, or whatever word your version says, while the full field feeds on trash. Underline those two words. Truth, trash. In fact, he, 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 here's, a, here's a question I have for you. Which of those two right there, truth or trash, will impact your life in a positive way? Which of these two will help you become more like Jesus? Truth or trash? Which of these two, thank you, Robert, which of these two will, will make you a, a better dad or a better mom? Which of these two will help you make good choices? Somebody who's wise is going to 
fill their life and their mind with, with truth. Fools are the ones who fill their mind and their life with trash. Truth is what really matters. So here's my next question. Which of these two do you make the choice to spend the most time with? Truth or trash? Truth. Wrestle around with that for a moment. I know you're here and for the next, you know, our gatherings are about an hour and a half long and so for an hour and a half all the music is about the truth and, you know, we're looking at the Bible and it's about the truth and, you know, we're doing all this stuff about the truth. You may go to prime time and you'll spend another hour in there and it's all about the truth. But really, think about it. In 168 hours or however many hours there are in a week, how much of it is spent with truth and how much of it is spent with trash? Listen, I've told you this before, but truth is, is something you have to go out and find. You have to go, go after it. You, you have to make the choice to, to, to go after truth. Trash, on the other hand, just gets dumped on you all day long. You don't even have to go out and work for it. Trash will be dumped on you all day long. You're listening to it on the radio when you're walking through the mall. You're hearing crummy songs. Uh, uh, you drive down McHenry Avenue and there's a half-naked lady trying to sell you a car. You walk through the mall and there's, you know, soft porn up on the walls trying to sell you stuff. I mean, trash is everywhere. It's dumped on you all the time. This, on the other hand, you got to go after, man. It's a choice that you have to make. I'm always um, amazed at how evil and trash uh, is always dreaming and thinking about how to impact our lives. We spend a fortune here at the church with our computer filtering uh, programs. In other words, uh, all the computers that we have here on campus, you know, the pastors have and the teachers have and all that, we want to make sure that trash doesn't get through and end up on our computers, uh, you know, porn or whatever. And we, we have the best that you can get. I mean, we really work hard. You go out to our library, you bring your children out to our library, you send your children out to our library. Unlike the public libraries, we make sure that stuff is filtered. We don't want trash just showing up uh, on computers that are hooked into our network here. But what's interesting to me is it doesn't take five minutes for us to put a new deal on to protect us from the trash, that evil, I don't know, they must have like staff meetings every day and they get together and go, okay, they're blocking this now and they come up with a way to go around it. They're always dreaming and thinking and strategizing on how to make sure that trash ends up on that little square thing that we all have in our homes or in our offices or those little devices that, that we hold. In fact, um, you know, there are times when you, you can be, you know, somebody sends you something, and you click on it, and boom! There's some crummy image, right? Some pornographic image. Um, has anybody ever clicked on to something, and boom! There was a Bible verse. <laughs> no! It's always evil. It's always wickedness. It's always trash. That's what happens. Truth. It takes some juice. You gotta, gotta set aside some time in the morning to get into the Word, don't you? 
Got to set some time aside in the afternoon and, and, and get into the Word. Got to set some time aside at night to say to everybody, maybe when the kids are all in bed and everybody's asleep and you turn off the TV, which is a hard thing to do, right? And you say, I'm going to put some tea on or some coffee on and I'm going to sit down now while the kids are asleep and now I'm going to spend some time. I'm going to make the choice to, to feed on truth. Getting up a little bit early and saying, hey, uh, uh, you know, honey, it's Tuesday morning and I wish I could help you a little bit, but I need to get to men's ministry this morning. I got to feed on the truth this morning with some of my, some of my, my guys. That takes, some, that takes some energy. You got to get up a little bit early, don't you? After a hard day at work, it's a Monday night, right, guys? Whew. Man, it'd just be nice to get home, put your feet up on the couch, get an iced tea, watch, you know, a football game. Or you could go to men's ministry and hang out with some guys and pray and get into truth. Wow, that's hard, isn't it? It's hard. Hard. I know. Don't, 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 don't think you get to where I'm at. If I can just be a pastor, it'd be easy. It's not. Jesus said this. Let me tell you why this is so important. Jesus said, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now, what exactly does truth set you free from? Well, truth sets you free from eating trash, for one thing. That's what it'll do. Every time you're, every time you're chewing on this, I know what you're not chewing on. Right? The truth sets you free from, from guilt and shame. The, the truth sets you free from the bondage of sin. The truth sets you free to, to live the fulfilled, abundant life that God made every one of us to live. The truth sets you free to say no to, to bad and crummy, sinful things. God gave us his, his truth to set us free. So, so make the choice to seek after God's truth above all else. Because if you don't, trash is just going to impact your life automatically. That, that's what happens. If you make the choice to say, you know what, today I'm just busy. I, I'm not getting up early to read the Word, study the Word. Uh, you know what, I don't have time at lunch while I'm eating my sandwich to read the Word or study the Word. Or, man, I'm home tonight. I just think I'm going to watch a football game. You make that decision, then you've also made the decision to allow trash to goof up your life and to goof up your family, and, and, and goof up whatever else, whatever else is going on in your life. That's the choice you make. I was thinking about, you know, the times that the, uh, the Grovers have encouraged us to come down here for prayer, whether it be as an individual, or as a family, or as a small group, or whatever. And Fridays, the last Friday of the, the month, we have this time where we where we want you to come and pray. And they, they, they kind of come up with a little list of things that they're looking at. and Man, they made it as easy as it can be. Hey, come down here at 6 a.m. and spend a half an hour here. Come at, at, at 10. Uh, come at 11.30. I don't know. Come at noon. Uh, come at 1. I mean, you, it's up to you. What works best for you? And boy, it's hard, isn't it? Hard to get it on the calendar. Hard to come down and just say, God, as a family, we're all going to be praying for these particular things. Why well, it's hard, isn't it? Life is full of choices. Every day we make lots of choices. And there always comes a moment when we're faced with the same choice that Moses had. Do I do, I do the right thing or do I do the pleasurable thing? Do I, do, I, do I obey God and his word or do I obey my flesh? And your answer will determine your future. So in verse 24, Moses makes the choice not to be called, you know, uh, uh, you know, the son of Pharaoh. And now in verse 25, he makes another choice. He makes the choice to do what is right, regardless of how it's going to make him feel. And in verse 26, he makes another choice. Moses made the choice to keep his eye on the ultimate prize. He made a, made a choice as to what he was going to look at, focus on in life, what his perspective on life was going to be. In verse 26, he says, 
he, that's once again Moses, thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt, for he, that's Moses, was looking ahead to his great reward. That was a choice he made. He, he wasn't going to look at all the stuff going on around him. He wasn't going to look at all the bars of gold, you know, sitting in Pharaoh's house that could have been his. He wasn't going to look at all of the, the gorgeous women he could have had if he would have stayed in Pharaoh's home. He wasn't going to look at all that. He wasn't going to look at the beautiful homes he could have had or, or furniture he could have had. He wasn't going to look at all of that. He wasn't going to look at all of the pleasures or even all of the hardships that were going to come if he, you know, was just honest about his life. He, he just said, hey, look, here's the deal. I'm focused right out. I'm focused on glory. I'm focused on the ultimate prize. I'm focused on heaven. That's what I'm focused on. That, 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 that's what matters. This reminds me a, a lot of what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He says, therefore, we do not lose heart. We don't, we don't give up. We're persistent. We endure. We keep on keeping on. We're diligent. We don't get discouraged. Though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles, and you ought to underline that, are achieving for us an eternal glory that outweighs them all. If you're discouraged here this morning, you need this passage. Paul's talking about the fact that he had gone through some rough times in his Christian life. Let me tell you what a few of those light and momentary troubles were. He had been beaten nearly to death on a number of occasions. He was shipwrecked twice. He had received 40 lashes from a whip, five times at least. He was sick and in prison. He was often left totally alone. And the amazing thing is that Paul calls these things light troubles. Light troubles. <laughs> How did he do this? How did he have this attitude? Beloved, it was all in his perspective. You see, Paul goes on to say this in verse 18. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, the temporary troubles, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And this is exactly what Moses did. He, he made the choice to look ahead to what he couldn't see with his human eyes. He looked ahead to the finish line instead of the here and now. He made the choice to keep his eye on the ultimate prize. And when you make you know, that choice, it, it just makes a, a difference in your life. We can't do anything about the troubles of life, the struggles of life. We can't do anything about it. But we can make a choice to either, you know, look at the finish line or look at all the troubles. In my office this past week, I, I have this um, uh, uh, Monesto B article that was done on me and my daughter uh, 17 years ago. And uh, my daughter was five at the time. She's now uh, 23. She's getting married next weekend. And I have this article that's been up and on my wall and the different desks that I've had over the years, different offices, about this article that the beat did on my daughter and I. It was uh, right after a really dark period in our lives. My wife had been killed in an automobile accident, and it was my daughter and I, and there she is sitting on my lap, she was young, and I had brown hair. Anyway, um, <laughs> you can hardly recognize me in the picture. <laughs> and somewhere in the article, and I don't know where I got the phrase, I don't know where it came from, but I, I basically talk about these two options that people have. And, and that is this, that when troubles come, when hard times come, you, you can either gaze at the Lord and glance at the troubles, because we live in the world, and so you, you can't totally keep your mind off of the troubles. Or you can gaze at all the troubles that are going on in your life, and every so often, you know, glance up at the Lord, you know. 
And for many believers, maybe some of you, you know, you come to church on Sunday morning, but other than that, that's about it. And so for you, all you do is glance at the Lord. And most of the time, you just gaze at all the troubles and bummers that go on in life. And then on Sundays, you do that. And then the rest of the week, you know, you're doing this. And Sunday rolls around, and you do that. And that impacts how you live. It impacts your attitude. Or you can be somebody who comes to church on a Sunday morning and gazes at the Lord, and when they go home, before they go to bed at night, they gaze at the Lord, and Monday morning they wake up, and they get into the Word, and they gaze at the, at the Lord, and they, they spend their day gazing at the Lord. And yes, every so often you've got to deal with the troubles and the problems of life that go on in your family or go on in your business or whatever it might be. But when you look at the life of Moses, and when you read what Paul says here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, their perspective was, I'm going to gaze here. That's where I'm going to look. I'm looking at the ultimate prize. And I'm not going to gaze at my troubles. I'll glance at them. Obviously, Paul knew about his troubles. He talks about them in the scriptures. But he made a, a, a decision that he was going to live differently. Paul said this in Philippians chapter 1. He said, for me, living means living for Christ. And dying is even better. And he's going to tell us why dying's better. He says, but if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. So I really don't know which one is better. I'm torn between two desires. I long to go and be with Christ. That's why dying was better. He had his eye on the ultimate goal. He knew that when he took his last breath here on planet Earth, he was going to spend his eternity, not 10 or 15 or 30 or 50 or 60 or 100 years here. Seems like a long time, I know. But compared to eternity, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Beloved, every one of us gets to make the choice as to what we're going to focus on, either the here and now or the ultimate prize, and the choice you make will determine a lot about how you live your life today. Now, now how did Moses pull this off? How was he able to make all these good and right choices? Well, well, I think the answer might be found in the first two words of verse 26. See, these are, good, these are two good words. A lot of people don't use these two words or don't think about this. Look at those first two words. He thought. Well, there's a concept. He engaged his brain, not his feelings. He thought. This means to evaluate or to consider the options or to weigh in the balance. Basically what this verse is saying is, is that Moses considered God's will for his life of greater value than anything else. He thought that doing God's will, regardless of the consequences, was the most important thing he could do which then led him to make the choices that he made. He, he, he thought. He thought. There's this, and then there's everything else that's out there. there, there there's this, or there's, well, I don't know, what Oprah thinks about life. There, 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 there's this, and there's whatever else. Whatever else the other stuff is. He thought about it. He thought. And if there's one message for the church in America today, those that are true followers of Christ, is we've got to engage our brains. We've got to think. That's what we think about. He thought about it. Let me tell you why this is so critical. It's critical because if you don't decide what's important for you, somebody else is going to do it. The world is more than happy to pressure you into its mold and impose its value system on you. If you don't decide, you know, how you're going to use your time, somebody else is going to decide for you. Right? If you don't say, you know what, Fridays I'm going to prayer, there'll be somebody else that'll determine that for you. 
Tuesday morning, I'm going to men. You don't make that decision. You don't think about that. There'll be something that somebody else will make sure that they think about it for you. If you don't think about how you're going to spend your money, I guarantee you every commercial made will, will help you make that decision for you. I watch some of the dumbest things on that home shopping network. And they have a little counter down in the corner of how many people are buying the thing. And I, I'm going, okay, one idiot, two idiots, five idiots, 20 idiots, 100 idiots, 3,000 idiots. It's unbelievable to me what people will buy. And the reason why they have those shows, the reason why they do commercials, is because they know people haven't made a decision about how they're going to spend their money. They haven't thought about it. And so guess what? They'll put together some fancy schmancy things and people will take out their credit cards and I bought one. In fact, they, they had a special deal. I got two of them. <laughs> and now both of them sit in your garage and neither one of them are used and you just fell that much more in debt. Let me tell you something. It's important that you think. It's important that you begin to determine what is it I'm going to value in life. The here and now? Or am I going to value the reward of heaven? What I get when I take my last breath here on, on planet Earth. Let me, let me illustrate why this is so important. How many of you can name just one of the many pharaohs? You can name just one. Just raise your hand. You can name one. Okay, and the reason why those of you raised your hand know at least one pharaoh is because of the movie The King and I. Um, <laughs> listen, when Moses was alive, the pharaohs were the most powerful men on the planet. The pharaohs were the wealthiest men on the planet. The, 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 the pharaohs were, were, were like um, the, the guys that they could fulfill any desire that they had. Yet few of you can even name one of them today. Hmm. Now listen carefully. If Moses would have made the choice to say no to God and no to God's plan in his life, and he would have said yes to the world's values, not one of you here would even know who Moses was. He'd be some mummy underneath a big ginormous pyramid. You wouldn't even know who he is, just like you don't know any of the other pharaohs. But the good news is, he didn't say no to God's plan for his life. He didn't say no to God's will. He said yes. That was the decision he made, and guess what? <laughs> even those of you who don't even believe that this is God's word know who Moses is. Everybody knows who Moses is. Nobody even knows who the pharaohs are, as great of men as they were at that moment in time. So Moses made three really important choices. Moses made the choice to be who God made him to be, and Moses made the choice to do what was right over what you know, felt good, and number three, Moses made the choice to keep his eye on the ultimate prize. Now, before I, I, I move on, I switched up the memory verse, and I did it last night, okay? So the memory verse you have at the bottom of your page you, you, the, the new one, you can go ahead and just mark that one out. Or, or here's an idea. How about memorize two verses this week? <laughs> what? What, what is our pastor's done loopy? Yeah. Two, two verses. Um, here, here, here's your memory verse. Ready? It's 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. For the eyes of the Lord reign throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. That's your new memory verse. And this passage right here gives us some really interesting data, and I'm going to end with this. It gives us some interesting, weighty data about God. 
And there's this idea that that God is kind of looking over the crowd right here. He's looking over the crowd there in the the venue. Maybe he's looking over you in your home as you're watching this online. And and he's looking, and God's able to see beyond, you know, the coat, the tie, the whatever. He can see into your heart. He, he, He knows. He knows. And when he sees somebody who's made the choice, maybe, to be who God has made them to be. He sees somebody who's willing to do the right thing over what feels good. He finds somebody who who says, you know what? Uh, 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 Heaven, glory is what matters to me. And that's going to dictate how I live. Let me tell you something. When he sees that kind of person, he stops right there. Yeah, gotcha. You're the one, I see you, you, you the man, I'm with you. And the Bible has this idea that he says, that's the person who I strengthen. That's the person who I'll do amazing things through. As I read this passage this week, I thought to myself, man, that's Moses. God saw the heart of Moses. God saw what kind of man he was, and God strengthened him. And the same thing is true for all of us. And the question we all have to wrestle around with is, look, what does God see when he stops here and looks at my life? Am I more concerned with everybody else thinks about me? Am I trying to be somebody else? Does pleasure kind of trump what's right? Do I care more about the here and now than really glory? And probably all of us at times, I don't care how long you've walked with the Lord, we, we, can, get, we can get our priorities goofed up, I, I get it. But maybe today as you go about your life, you go about your day, maybe as you begin to write this scripture out and put it on your window or put it in your car or wherever it is to help you memorize it, Maybe, maybe you'll think about these things, these little decisions that Moses made and made him such a great person. And that maybe you'd say, God, I want you to stop here. I want you to see my life. I want you to strengthen me. I want to be the best dad that I can be. I want to be the best mom I can be. I want to be the best parent I can be. I want to be the best son or daughter that I can be. I want to be the best employee, God, that I can be. I want to be the best business owner, God-honoring business owner. I can be, God. Look here. Look here. Over in the venue, why don't you stand in here? Just stand and let me pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for um, our weekends here at Big Valley. I, man, Saturday nights are fantastic. I love them. I love them, Lord. I love Sunday mornings here, God. Thank you for all of those that sing in the choir and play in the orchestra. Thank you, Lord, for the people and their generosity, Father. I love to come and be with your people, Lord. But would you help uh, us to be a, a group of people who look at the life of Moses and wrestle around with the same things he had to wrestle around with. Help us, God, to think and make good choices. Lord, I'd love to think that every soul that walks out of here, Lord, you would see into their hearts and go, wow, I'm strengthening that person. I'm going to do something unbelievable through that life. Because they see folks, Lord, as you see folks who are committed to you, God. Lord, I think about all of those that are in our sphere of influence that we're going to be inviting to Easter here in a couple of weeks, God. So I've prayed a hundred times, if not a thousand. Go before us, Lord. Work in the hearts of those that we're going to invite. That this place would be filled with those who do not know you. And that you would somehow open their eyes to the truth of your love for them. And I pray this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and all of God's people said, amen. Amen. Hey, Lord bless you.